to Washington. A decade later, i.e. today, uh, the political and policy <laughs> landscapes have shifted in several ways. Uh, let me mention a few of those, and then we will, then we will commence. Um, first, uh, as everybody knows, the Obama administration's ESEA blueprint and now waiver program uh, signify that at least some Democrats have changed course on federal accountability requirements. Uh, the administration, as you know, has also placed newfound emphasis on competitive grants as instruments of federally driven education reform. Best known example, of course, being Race to the Top. A second development, um, Congress has uh, been deadlocked. Uh, this is, I guess, a non-development. Uh, Congress has uh, been deadlocked on how to reauthorize um, and uh, presumably revise uh, NCLB. Uh, I'm sure Senator Alexander will be able to explain why they have been deadlocked. Uh, third, at least a few Republican congressional leaders, uh, most obviously in the House, uh, have made clear their preference for significantly rolling back the federal role in education and placing nearly all decision-making authority in state or district or parent hands. Um, uh, and finally, uh, Governor Romney, uh, uh, de described in the media these days as the presumptive nominee, uh, has signaled some dissatisfaction with No Child Left Behind and has articulated a different set of priorities based primarily on portable sort of voucher-like uh, federal funds using Title I and, um, and special ed uh, and um, has placed a strong emphasis on school choice and on parent-driven reform. So what do we make of all this? Uh, where's the Republican Party headed uh, in education, particularly at the <laughs> national level? Uh, there's nobody uh, better qualified to discuss this than our two uh, uh, conversation partners today. Uh, and their biographies are in your folders uh, or were available at the table when you walked in. I'll just give one short paragraph on each. It uh, doesn't begin to do justice. Um, uh, Margaret Spelling served as White House Domestic Policy Advisor from 2001 to 2005 and then as Secretary of Education from 2005 to 2009. Before the White House, she was Senior Advisor to Governor Bush. Uh, she led governmental and external relations for the Texas Association of School Boards and served in key positions at Austin Community College and with the Texas Legislature. Today, she is President of her own consulting firm. Um, and widely regarded as a leading expert on public policy. And she also serves as a strategic advisor to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and uh, its U.S. Forum for Policy Innovation. Lamar Alexander, in his second term uh, in the U.S. Senate, uh, he, he arrived uh, a year after NCLB was enacted, uh, probably worth underscoring, uh, uh, represents the uh, uh, great state of Tennessee, uh, where he previously served as a successful two-term governor who placed heavy emphasis on education reform even before it was fashionable. Uh, he also chaired the National Governors Association. He subsequently served as president of the Univer University of Tennessee, and he too served as Secretary of Education, in his case for the first President Bush, and was lead author of a policy package called America 2000 that I think could fairly be termed a forerunner of Goals 2000 and arguably even of NCLB itself, or at least parts of NCLB. In the Senate, he's been chairman of the Republican Conference, a senior member of the Help Committee, Appropriations Committee, the Rules Committee, the Environment and <coughs> Public Works Committee. So let me now turn to them both, beginning with uh, Margaret Spellings um, and, and then Lamar Alexander. L and let me ask it this way. Uh, next month, the Republican Party will unveil its 2012 platform, presumably including an education plank. Uh, you are two of the most articulate, experienced, and knowledgeable persons within the GOP on these issues. As we look to the upcoming election and beyond, what should be the Republican Party's stance on K-12 education, particularly as regards federal policy? Take it away, Margaret. All and right. Thanks thank for being you, here. Shaker. No, thank you. And thank you for convening the forum. I'm delighted to be sharing it with Senator Alexander, who, um, you know, unlike a lot of folks in Washington or in <coughs> higher ed institutions, has been on the battlefield of actually trying to do things and pass things and implement things. and. Um, it's an honor to be with you, Senator, so thank you. Um, I'm really glad to be here because I have had, through the course of my public policy career, the opportunity to, to see this from various vantage points in government, working on behalf of local school boards for two Republican governors uh, in the Texas legislature, and of course during my time here in Washington. The majority of my experience was spent you know, in, in the local level, at the state and local level. And when I think about the topic before us today, uh, I think about what it is to be a Republican. I was elected as a precinct chairman in my neighborhood in the early, uh, in my early 20s, 
And I think about, you know, what, what, are, what are we about? And when mm -hmm. I think about that and our core values, our ideals, I, I am reminded of a few things that, that, at least for me, are why I'm doing this. Uh, we are the party of Lincoln. We are the folks, uh, Earl Warren led the Supreme Court to the Brown versus the Board of Education decision. Uh, it was President Eisenhower who sent troops to Arkansas. I mean, we stand for the values of opportunity, uh, and I think that is our proud heritage. And uh, I also know that, you know, we're the, op we're the party of opportunity and merit. And I think we're seeing this play out in the, in the debate now with President Obama's commentary on small business and who it is that builds small business and so forth. But we believe, I think, that, that our public sector, our government, uh, and other providers ought to, ought to give American citizens the tools to be successful and, and then, you know, go for it. You know, we are about opportunity and merit. Um, I also think that, that we're about taxpayer accountability and fiscal <coughs> prudence. And for 40 years we tried a strategy of sort of putting the money out and hoping for the best, high ideals in the aftermath of the, of the civil rights uh, period. And, uh, you know, with a focus always, the federal role has always been around our most disadvantaged students, poor, minority, and special education students. But with No Child Left Behind, we began to say, what are we getting for our money? We need some information. We want to know, you know, our kids being left behind, who's being left behind, where are they being left behind, and, and drill down a little, little further. Um, that, uh, that accountability and transparency I think has been a huge game changer in American education and has really driven a lot of the public policy that we're talking about <coughs> now whether it's pay for performance ain't no pay for performance without performance without some information about about how to do that um, so it's been obviously the the signature element of the law we're also about freedom and personal choice I'm proud to have worked for a president that uh, was the primary advocate, and, and I can tell you we worked hard on getting the DC Choice program over the line, and it was not easy for those of you all who were here at the time. Uh, we saw the first ever and most robust uh, expansion and use of federal dollars into parent hands by way of the supplemental services uh, dollars flowing to parents and families. Uh, we were here in the rapid expansion of the charter school movement and, and worked hard for federal support for, for charter facilities. Um, and and mo most importantly, again, or uh, as importantly, back to the need to have consumers who are informed so that they can use their, their choices wisely. And I think that's a role that government has played, whether it's in transparency around lending or food safety or food labeling. Uh, you know, an empowered, cons a a a an empowered consumer is a, c a consumer who's, who's informed. Uh, and then finally, I would say, of course, we're the, we're the party of limited government. And I think there's really two legitimate ways we can approach federal policy when it comes to education. One is, and many of our partisan friends uh, uh, advocate for this, is to abolish the Department of Education, to eliminate funding in a federal role, and to, you know, let the chips fall as they may, to literally uh, consider this, you know, only a state priority. Uh, the other uh, option, in my view, is to, is to create a role where we invest dollars strategically because we believe it's a national imperative, that it's in our national security interests and many other ways, uh, to, to play this role with respect to uh, disadvantaged populations and to get something for our money in that physical prudence. So I, I think uh, uh, we'll, we'll obviously spend the next hour or so talking about this, but I think we've calibrated that, that mix uh, pretty well in current law, which is not to say there are plenty of things that can't and shouldn't be changed. No piece of legislation ever passed by any uh, elected body is perfect and uh, can be tweaked and should be improved as we learn more. So I think as we debate sort of the niceties of, of federalism and federal policy, we also have to keep our eye on the ball, and that is, how are the kids doing? I mean, the whole reason that we are convened here uh, and do what we do every day is because we care about the future of our country and the, and the students who will, who will make for it. Thank you very much. Senator. Thanks, Checker. It's, uh, Checker has not only been a asking uncomfortable questions for a long time of the education establishment, he actually done a lot of constructive things. He helped create, for example, the first program to pay teachers more for teaching well, and I've enjoyed working with him for a long, long time. Thank you. And 
I remember meeting Margaret, really, in the basement of the Texas State Capitol <laughs> years ago, uh, talking about who might be President George W. Bush's education secretary, and it was pretty obvious to me when we left, because I was a big admirer of what he did in Texas, that, that she'd make a pretty good one herself, and she certainly, and she certainly did. Let me try to answer your question with three, with three points. Question about what should Republicans do? I think first we ought to we ought to declare some victory. Now I don't mean victory in terms of uh, children knowing and be able, being able to do uh, what they what they need to be able to do. Where the achievement results over the last 30 years are are disappointing. There some progress, but disappointing. But if you think of President Reagan and Terrell Bell and Bill Bennett as sort of the Paul Revere and uh, <laughs> George, George W. And, and President, the first President Bush, for whom I work, as a consensus builder and as a national leader, I make a distinction between national, a whole country composed of states, and federal, which is action by the federal government. And the national part included Governor George W. Bush during the 19. 80s and 90s, I guess, was, were, were, were those years. And then the George W. Bush years were increased federal action. You've, you've got a lot of Republican leadership over that time, you've got a lot of national advocacy that's important. And on a parallel track, you've got the governors and a lot of things going on locally. You've got Tommy Thompson and John Engler and Tom Kane and, and a lot of Carol Campbell, a lot of leading Republicans who were taking important steps. And it's important, it's important to say that during that whole 30-year period, you, you had some very important Democratic leadership as well. I mean, for every Tommy Thompson, there was a governor, Bill, Bill Clinton, or Dick Riley, or Bob Graham in their early days. And the truth is that President Clinton and President Obama both have challenged their natural constituencies on important issues, like charter schools, for example, uh, and, and rewarding outstanding teaching as another example. So over the last 30 years, I mean, a lot has happened. And, and uh, content standards are in place for annual tests for reading and math. You've got common core academic standards in all but four states. You've got tests to meet those standards. Two consortia are, are, are developing those tests. You have common accountability standards being developed by states. Uh, thanks to No Child Left Behind, you've got an extensive system of reporting on how <laughs> children are actually uh, achieving. Uh, people are paying more attention to these issues. Uh, charter schools, I can remember the last thing I did as education secretary in 92 when the American people excused me from my job and <laughs> I went home to Tennessee was to write all those school superintendents in the state and ask them to try these start from scratch schools that were being done in Minnesota. There were like nine of them then. That was 20 years ago. Today there are 5,000 charter schools and about 5% of our, our schools. And teacher evaluation systems have moved to the forefront of our discussion and principal evaluation, how you do this difficult thing. And, and it wasn't long ago, I mean, 1983, I could say that not one state paid one teacher one penny more for teaching well. So there's some real, there's some real progress. Not enough in terms of results, but, but some progress. I think Republicans ought to be proud of that and, and look at the advantages. My own conclusion is there, we've reached a point as we look ahead, I'm going to give you the two, the, the two, two tracks ahead. One would be the track that down deep when I'm all alone and really, if I were king, that I would be for and that I've always been for. And then two, I'm going to give you a practical suggestion, which is different <laughs> than, than the first one. The, 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 where I'd really like to go is where I went in 30 years ago in the early 80s when I asked for an appointment with President Reagan and went to see him and said, Mr. President, let's have a grand swap. Uh, I'd been governor a couple of years. I said, you take all of Medicaid, because I could see that it was going to eat us up in the states. We'll take all of K through 12 education. Now, I did that for two reasons. One was I thought that financially that I, I could see Medicaid squeezing education out of state budgets. And it has. It's ruined support for public higher education over the last 30 years. 25% of, of, of state budgets is now Medicaid. So if we'd made that swap back then, there'd been enormous fiscal advantages. The states would have come out ahead about $5 billion. We'd have about $5 billion extra dollars to spend. Today, we'd have $92 billion extra to spend each year. Mm. 
That'd be $2 billion for Tennessee and $6 or $8 billion for Texas if then we'd done that. And I would argue that over that 30-year period of time, none, none of us knows what would have happened. But we could have still had a nation at risk. We still could have had the national education goals. We stu still could have had presidential advocacy along with state-by-state -state work, and we'd have accountability and the money where it ought to be. Now, that's not what happened. And even though President Reagan liked the idea, proposed it in 1982 in his State of the Union address, it was hard to do then, and it would be even harder <coughs> today. So that's not practical. So what should we do? Here's what I would suggest we do. First, I, I suggest that we declare we, we, we pat ourselves on the back for what's happened before for each of the three Republican presidents. And then we say, okay, it's time to, to do the next step. The next step, I think, is to put the spotlight where the spotlight needs to be. And for the next phase, it needs to back, be back on families, it needs to be back on states and schools. So I think it's time to move the responsibility for deciding which schools and teachers are succeeding or failing back to states and communities. I think we need to continue the reporting that has been developed under No Child Left Behind. That creates an opportunity for a national report card that will be better than any education secretary ever thought he or she might, might have with extensive information. If you go to Chicago, you can say you've not only got the worst schools, you can say you've got the best schools and here's why. You've got the worst schools and here's why and know exactly what you're talking about. I think we ought to encourage, not mandate, teacher evaluation systems, consolidate federal programs, expand and encourage charter schools, help states turn around the bottom 5% of the schools, and do everything we can think of to strengthen families. I mean, family discussions are about more than abortion and gay rights. I mean, we've gotten, we focused on that as a party. We should go beyond that and end what has really been a war on parents, making it harder for them to raise children, and think of all the different ways that we can help them uh, succeed. Professor Coleman in Chicago used to say that his research showed that parents were twice as important as the school before a child is 14. And I think we can be strong advocates for all the creative ways we can think of to strengthen families and make it easier, not harder, for parents to raise children. And one last thing we could do with Title I, I think uh, Governor Romney's proposed this, we could allow Title I money, which is about $15 billion, I guess, to, to follow each child to the school it goes to. That would be a, a, a step forward. And if we have extra money lying around, which we don't, uh, <laughs> I've proposed a Pell Grant for kids. I, I think that even if you were to give almost all the responsibility back to the states, you could still reserve uh, maybe $500 for every child at a middle income level and below to use for after school programs. Now that cost about $15 billion a year. We don't really have that right now in the federal government, but that's a Republican proposal that we could make. So a pat on the back. I've told you what my dream would be, but if we deal with the world the way it is today, I would suggest uh, that we, we take those steps that I just mentioned, which would be a, a pretty good and aggressive Republican agenda that would build on the successes of, of Paul Revere, the consensus builder, and President George W. Bush and Margaret's efforts over their time here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in a minute, we'll come back to your uh, uh, reality uh, plan, but I'd love to get Margaret's thoughts on your ideal plan, your dream plan. Uh, in, in retrospect, uh, rewriting history, would it have been a good idea? Uh, would we be happy today uh, if President Reagan had persuaded the Congress to essentially swap uh, Medicaid for um, education, for K-12 education? Yeah, obviously we don't know, yeah. but but you know when I think about uh, when Bush was elected and you know there was a lot of uh, accolade and high fiving about you know the power of annual assessment and disaggregated data, but the truth was even though obviously they were certainly free to do it, you know very very few states had actually done that. Most states had sort of snapshot accountability systems with a third grade test, an eighth grade test, and an exit test or some such. Um, often not disaggregated, et cetera. And so I guess when I think about it, you know, it's not against the law today for communities, parents, you know, to, to close the achievement gap. And I'm going to lay this more on, on obviously the system than on parents because I think parents are, you know, often uh, disenfranchised from schools. And, and there is a, a war on, on kind of that kind of engagement and involvement often. It's a system that works for the system. Um, so, I, so I think about, you know, would we see that kind of inertia uh, it, it had we gone to that, that sort of model. When I look at the waivers uh, that we're seeing from the states, 
a lot of amazing rhetoric and I think really true belief from governors and you know Republican governors. I was just at the NGA. Wonderful people who are working hard. But when you start to look at the fine print of the waivers that are coming out of these their state departments of education, sometimes not you know in a, in, a, in an accountability system or a governance system that is connected to that governor. I'll, I'll add quickly a statewide elected chief or whatever. But the fine print just isn't there. I mean, there's a retreat from subgroup accountability. There's a retreat from meaningful consequences. There's a retreat from choice. And so I want to believe that, that all would be well um, had we tried that experiment, mm -hmm. but, but I wonder. Okay. Well, that segues back to Lamar because uh, you indicated a few minutes ago that you had reached a point where you think a fair amount of authority ought to be returned to states. And I wonder if you could talk about what led you to that conclusion. What, uh, what, uh, what caused you to uh, conclude that uh, returning more of this authority to states would be a good thing to do or that not doing it is a bad thing to do, whatever? Well, two things, Checker. One is I've always believed it. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just an old, unreformed governor, and I, 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 I didn't. I never thought people in Washington could do things better than I could. That's just my idea, and I didn't think I got any smarter by taking an airplane up here. So, that's my <laughs> basic attitude. The second is I'm uh, what James Q. Wilson writing about Irving Kristol when he died. He, he described the neoconservatives and said we weren't really conservatives. We were policy skeptics. I'm a policy skeptic. I mean, we got a hundred thousand public schools. We got fifty million teachers. We got three. I mean, fifty million kids. Three million teachers in the schools. I don't think a well-meaning staff member of the U.S. Department of Education, and that's what it usually is, can, can come up with a very good rule or law or, 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 or decision that, if, that, that really helps that much around the country or that takes into account all the differences. So, so I often hear, you know, these are our debates up here, let's do this, what about this idea, what about, these are all fine ideas, but if you're teaching the fourth grade, you know, Maryville, Tennessee, it, it may not fit those circumstances. So what I, what I prefer to do is give credit to our Republican and Democratic presidents for their national advocacy over the last 30 years, and to Margaret and Governor Bush for, President Bush, Governor President Bush for No Child Left Behind, say let's take the best of that, and the reporting part is the best part of it, and the advocacy raised standards and caused people to do some things they wouldn't do, so great, they did that. Now, how are we going to finish the job? Now, I think we're more likely to finish the job. I, putting the spotlight back on families, governors, and local schools. So if you leave the Maryville teacher to do her thing, or the Maryville school board to do its thing, uh, what will cause them to do it better or do it for more kids than they did yesterday before the federal government started pushing them around? Well, and Maryville's really a bad example. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Well, because they're so good. I mean, they right, they won the football. Memphis. They they won football for 13 years, and, they, and they're also named the best public school system in the state. And they're a middle income, you know. They've just got to never a, ask a person about the town they come from. Well, no, no, they are. They, they, Bill Bennett used to say, "Don't use the Maryville example because every community is not." Not terrible, right. and I'm not sure exactly why it is. It's just because for a long time the communities decided it wanted good schools. I mean, my model uh, checker is is our higher education system, which is a little different. It's not the same, but it's the closest thing we have. And there we've got 6,000 autonomous institutions, and some are better than others, but collectively they're the best in the world. And I think the more we move toward toward that sort of decentralized system, the more likely we are we have overall better schools. But some are going to be better than others. There's just no getting around it. Why? Which is why you give, as we do in colleges, students choices. You and Governor Bush obviously uh, concluded in Texas that leaving individual districts each to do their own thing was not going to uh, bring about the kinds of changes you wanted for Texas kids. And um, so you put a fair amount of, of um, spotlight and, 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 and sunshine and uh, pressure, I'd say, on them from Austin. Um, and it did some good. I mean, there was no doubt that the data evaluating Texas education performing, performance at the time of the, uh, of, of the election was really, uh, ran corporation, all sorts of people said so. Um, 
question, I guess, that, that, that concerns me today, and I didn't think about it maybe as much as I should have uh, 10 years ago, is uh, does the same logic work from Washington? Uh, does um, putting a spotlight and pressure on uh, schools and districts from the state capital equivalent to putting a spotlight and pressure on the states themselves from Washington? Does it work? Well, I, I think it does. I think it, uh, let me just say, I think it works a lot better than the alternative, um, which we tried for 40 years. And so, you know, No Child Left Behind boiled down and in its essence says, test, report, get kids somewhere, 2014 grade level proficiency, none of which we would stand for simply for our own children, by the way, um, and do something if you can't, consequences. And that, you know, that combination of things, I think, is what has seen and what has caused more intense uh, action on behalf of poor minority and special kids than ever before, period. And when I, I heard uh, Katie Haycock do a thing at the Hunt Institute deal the other day, and, you know, we've, we've seen this. I mean, it, it just, the numbers, the numbers are there. So I, I, I think that, you know, when we try to calibrate what the federal government should and shouldn't do, those are the things we should do. What we shouldn't do, and I, and I wrestle with this, um, as we think about after school and common core and technology and reading instruction and, and choice and all the things that we would, would wish to have happen, I mean, how do we square the circle uh, with our 9% thereabouts level of investment and expecting something to happen on behalf of poor minority kids, our, you know, raison d'etre, and, and all the kind of prescription and orthodoxy that we, w that we ascribe to. And so I, I think we have to kind of figure out how to square those, those illogics in a sensible way. Um, and, and I think the power ought to be around assessment, uh, results, transparency, and consequences, and less so on what, do you, what should you do about it. It's the consequences piece um, where a lot of people think that uh, no Child Left Behind hasn't worked very well. That is, the, all the transparency, all the information, all the uh, um, uh, mm. comparability, things like that. Uh, I, I don't know anybody that actually thinks that hasn't been a, a, a plus for America. Uh, argument over whether the standards against which the results are being reported are where they ought to be. But uh, everybody thinks that having the comparable disaggregated data is a plus. But the consequences piece, can that be done effectively for okay, Washington? Okay, so I, I want to I wanna say a couple things. The reason that people can run around and say, the Texas standards are not as good as the Massachusetts standards is because for the first time ever, No Child Left Behind required that every state participate in the National Education Report Card, which Senator Alexander has been a, a huge fan and advocate for. Uh, we now have a, a method by which we can check the system. And, and states in, in their quest for excellence and, and communities in their quest for excellence theoretically would use that information to move the needle. Remember, they're still paying, you know, 90 cents on the dollar uh, for the enterprise. With respect to the consequences, yeah. of course I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, we designed a system uh, and put the educators whose ox was to be gored, if you will, in charge of that part of the, of, the, of the law, of the bargain. And we said, take money out of your own pocket and give it to needy families so they could get extra help. Well, needless to say, it was not, they had a conflict of interest. They were not very aggressive about telling parents and families about those options. Um, and I mean, I've talked to many, many minority parents who felt thwarted by and, and challenged by their ability to even use those things. So can they be better designed? You bet. Um, should we require something to happen other than information? Also, absolutely. But you don't think gore your own ox is a good prescription for a change? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, if we had to do it again. So speaking of having to do it again, uh, Senator, uh, uh, <laughs> explain the Congress to me. <laughs> uh, How long is this program? The, uh, <laughs> well, we'll take till tomorrow if we, if we, if we need to. I mean, uh, every federal law that I can remember has gotten slower and slower and slower to get revisited and reauthorized in recent years. But I don't think anything's gotten as slow as the No Child Left Behind Act. Uh, or as kind of um, out, outdated. Um, and obviously, uh, uh, Secretary uh, Duncan has decided to take the law into his own hands uh, to solve the problem. But uh, without even getting to the waiver question, 
Why has the Congress been unable to grapple with uh, these repairs that um, Margaret also is acknowledging uh, ought to get made? Well, one is that when you move so many uh, complicated decisions to Washington, they're hard to do. Mm. And uh, I mean, we're talking about decisions that are made in 100,000 schools every day. And so when you, when you, when you get a bunch of United States senators sitting around making an education policy for, <clears throat> for a classroom, they come up with every goofy idea you can think of. And then we have to argue about whether, or good idea, mm. shall, shall we do this in every school in the country? Shall each teacher do the following? <coughs> shall the superintendent from Denver fly to Washington and ask permission to do this, that, or the other? If we're going to have a teacher evaluation system, exactly what should be in it? And should the Department of Education in Washington define it? And how can they define it if nobody knows what one is? Uh, so these are difficult issues. Second, you've got a, you've got a, um, you got a dif difference of opinion. I mean, the, de there's the Democrats still are in favor of more federal action. Republicans are generally in favor of the prescription that I gave, which is time to, to go back to the states. Now, having said that, uh, Secretary Duncan and I, and Senator Enzi, several of us agreed on eight or nine fairly, fairly simple things that we thought we should do and had a basis for a bill, and we actually reported one in the Senate. I, I don't like it very much, but I voted to move it ahead. It's much too long, too many extra things in it. So uh, it, it's just, um, I, I think it's mainly the problem, I mean, to, for, for the President and Margaret uh, did what a President who is leading should do on his priority. <laughs> which is devote full attention to it until he got it done, and he did that. He he he, he used the power of the presidency to do something, uh, it, but it was hard to do, and it transported to Washington a lot of decisions that are usually made in state capitals or local school mm -hmm. districts. It's now without a, even though President Obama has taken some some good positions on no on on elementary secondary education and its reauthorization, with, with which I agree some of which I agree, um, it's still hard to do. And without it being a huge presidential priority, mm -hmm. it's going to be hard to reauthorize, unless one party or the other gets uh, a big majority. Okay. Um, one of the areas where Secretary Duncan has proposed a big change uh, is in the accountability piece, uh, the consequences piece, if you will, of uh, No Child Left Behind. Uh, which he's proposed uh, winding down to essentially a focus on the lowest performing 5% of schools in the country, uh, as opposed to all schools that don't meet the uh, proficiency standard. Uh, how do you both feel about this uh, sort of tight focus on the worst of the worst, as opposed to um, a much longer list of uh, uh, schools that range from um, not quite good enough to really, really, really awful? Well, you know, I think we all recognize, and, and certainly I've worked on this and, uh, with my waiver authority before I left office, that, that this idea of differentiated accountability is, is rational. That, you know, a school that barely misses a target in a subgroup is a different kind of school than one who has chronically failed for decades and decades, period. And we ought to look at that. Having said that, however, I don't think, or I do think, that right now today, every single school in this country Fairfax County Hispanic parents, Fairfax County suburban uh, special ed parents have to understand the tool and the pressure of no child left behind. And what I worry is if when we retreat to that 5% only, that it basically becomes you know, the Suburban Schools Relief Act. And that no child left behind, while a catchy and now sullied brand, <laughs> um, you know, actually describes the policy. It means no child left behind in Fairfax County and Houston, Texas and Harlem and, you know, et cetera. And, and so I think, I, I hope that we won't lose that, that feature. How do you feel about the sort of targeted? Well, I, uh, I, I agree with what Secretary Duncan proposed. He basically proposed to, to move back to the states and to the communities the decisions about whether a school and a teacher is succeeding or failing. And let's say that the No Child Left Behind period, which was to be five and now 10 years, has been helpful in that mm -hmm. effort. I think the next step is to do it, is to do it that way. And, and just even though 5% doesn't sound like much, that's mm -hmm. 5,000 schools. I mean, in Tennessee, that's uh, maybe 100 schools. 
that means the federal government is going to be directly involved in trying to fix 100 schools. I mean, who's going to do that up here? I mean, I don't know people in Tennessee who are very good at doing that. And I certainly don't know many people in Washington who have much to do that. So I think that's a lot. Here's the old policy skeptic coming out of me. I, I just think when you get into this next stage, it's got to be done locally. And there can be exhortation and leadership and national report cards and reporting. There can be encouragement for charter schools and teacher evaluation, all of that from here. But I think for this next stage, you've just got to stimulate it locally. So I support what he recommended. Well, when I worked at the Department of Education, we've all worked at the Department of Education, there were about 5,000 employees. So you could have one Department of Education employee per school, uh, uh, fanning out across the country, uh, each fixing his or her own school. Uh, that leaves 95,000, of course. Yes, I understand. Uh, some of which are not all they should be, many of which, uh, unfortunately, are not all they should be. All right. I agree, actually. Most of which are not all they should be, even though in too many cases their parents or community think they are everything they mm -hmm. ought to ever be uh, and, and, and don't know any better. Okay, I want to switch to uh, school choice issues for a minute. It's been a focus of uh, uh, the Romney proposal. Uh, it's been promoting school choice in various ways. It's been a long-time interest of your Senator. And the public school choice um, and uh, uh, supplemental services provisions of No Child Left Behind. Uh, were, um, were, th were things you were, and, and President Bush were heartily behind. Um, is choice something that the federal government can meaningfully promote or make happen? Uh, or is this, at the end of the day, one of the things that has to be left to um, uh, state decision making? I think yes, in part. Um, you know, again, it's tricky with this nine percent investor role yeah. to 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 deal with some of that. But uh, obviously, I support the Title One portability provisions that that Governor Romney has laid out. Um, I, I think when I think about choice, choice it, with with information is a beautiful thing. With choice and accountability, it, it, as as part of the consequences. Uh, rubric I think makes a lot of sense and when when Senator Alexander talks about the 5,000 schools I mean I think those are exactly the places where we say get the heck out of there and that we have a vigorous consequential uh, choice uh, you know lever that that would be available to those to families kids. say to the kids get the heck out of absolutely there. Yeah. yeah 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 and so I mean those are the sorts of things that I think you know if it's right and righteous for us to intervene in 5,000 schools then let's make the primary you know arrow in that quiver a school choice uh, you know mechanism. Mm -hmm. What do you think about uh, I mean you've had the the GI Bill for kids uh, and uh, the Pell Grant for kids ideas uh, for as long as I've known you. Uh, can these be made to happen from Washington any more than uh, uh, school achievement can be made to happen from Washington. Well, with money, you could. You could offer money if you had it. I mean, <laughs> Ted, I mean we don't really have it right now, but Ted, Ted Sizer, who was a great educator over the years, uh, had a you know, 30 or 40 years ago proposal to give every poor child in America $5,000 to go to any school of their choice. It's basically the same sort of idea that we, that we have for our college grants and loans, where we have generous amounts of money that follow you to Yeshiva or Vanderbilt or Nashville Auto Diesel College, wherever you, wherever you go. So it's, uh, that's the way for the federal government to do it, is just to give money to families and let them choose the school. Now you could argue, well, people going to college uh, know more than, than kids do or parents of kids, but you know, we, we don't tell parents where to go to buy their clothes and that kind of thing. So, so I, I'm for those kinds of programs. That, that President, but I've never been in favor of the federal government mandating us, you know, Texas or Tennessee to do it, which is why President Bush the first proposed a GI Bill for kids, which would help save Milwaukee, which was trying to do mm. that, uh, give money to them and supplement the efforts that they were making mm -hmm. so parents would have choices. That's why I think a, a, GI, uh, a, a Pell Grant for kids with federal dollars would be useful for after school supplementary programs. I think I use the College Station, you know, and Margaret, if you go to College Station, you got where all the professors live, the property tax is high, where a lot of other people live, the property tax is low, and, and the schools for these over here, the Pell Grant for Kids would pour a lot of money into here because 90% of the kids would have a federal Pell Grant for Kids. I, li I, I like 
that idea. And I think Governor Romney's proposal to take Title I money and let it follow a, a child to the school, wherever that child goes, is, is a sound proposal, <laughs> one which I support. And that affects $15 billion mm -hmm. federal dollars. So I th we have had some progress with choice, but I think it has to be locally inspired. It doesn't work everywhere. But it's one way to give parents, uh, if we're looking for ways <laughs> To, to, end the, to instead of a war on parents, try to help parents raising children, giving them options is a good way to do it. Susan, there's a chair here if you'd like. I didn't want to get in the way of the camera call attention it's to myself. <laughs> well, oh, beautiful. The camera will uh, thank you for being here. <laughs> making, making the room look fuller than it is. Uh, uh, and, 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 and welcome. This actually gets to another issue I wanted to get to, which is the, which is the uh, competitive grants strategy for education reform that has become a big deal, obviously, with the Obama administration, and yet a number of Republicans seem quite skeptical about it. I mean, historically, federal programs that were trying to bring about change in education have done so either through kind of regulation or through formula grants uh, with, with rules attached, I guess another way of saying regulation. Uh, obviously, Secretary Duncan has uh, concentrated through Race to the Top and other, other programs, several other uh, big programs on uh, kind of competitive grants, let those that want to make this change apply for the money. Uh, and if they make a convincing case that they really want to make this change, they'll get the money. Um, and um, I, to me, that sounds a little bit like what you were just saying about let, uh, uh, you know, let Milwaukee apply for the, for the money to do the thing it wants to do. Yeah. Why are so many Republicans, uh, or you don't have to justify them, but why are so many of them doubting this competitive grants approach? Well, two reasons. One is a lot of Republicans don't want any federal involvement. <coughs> okay. Uh, that's one. But Republicans and Democratic senators don't like competitive grants. They just want money to go to their <laughs> states <laughs> and their districts. So I'm a supporter. I mean, once I move out of my ideal mode, yeah. which I've been out of for about 30 years now, <laughs> big swap, I like, I like the competitive grants approach. See, I like, if, 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 take teacher evaluation. Uh -huh. I know how hard that is. And you can say, well, let's mandate it from Washington. I'm not for that, but, but I'm for encouraging it. And one way to do that is competitive grants to school districts who are trying it, like the teacher incentive fund that Margaret added and no child left behind or using title II funds for that arnie would like to do that i agree i agree with that so i think competitive grants if we're if, if we're going to have federal involvement mm -hmm. in local school district confederate com, competitive grants for worthy purposes are good too how about you on this yeah i mean I, 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 in and of itself i don't i don't have any issue with it either and we did it too reading first essentially was a competitive grant that that i mean i see your whole language hijinks report over there it said yeah. it was aimed at that it, yeah and so on so i i don't disagree with senator alexander i guess i would say that you know it, with respect to race at the top i kind of want to see you know the proof in the pudding also i mean it's one thing to enact to lift a cap uh from a charter school law but but where are the charters I mean, I, you know, it's not just enough to, to do the symbolism. Um, you know, I'd like to see, I'd like sure. to see it Sure, but as an engine of, of change, if you have a, a something which is not a, uh, a civil right issue like uh, disabilities mm -hmm. or a uh, universal spreading money issue, right? Uh, it, it, but rather a reform, a get people to encourage a change type of issue, yeah. is this a good way to... Yeah, I don't have any issue with it either. Okay. Um, you know, check your teacher evaluation is a good example of that. I mean, I've... I find myself in a, you know, some people think in a difficult position, or not difficult, but unusual position, because in, as Checker well remembers, in 1983 and 84, I had a, I had a, what you might call a brawl with the <laughs> National Education Association. A brawl, a yes. A brawl for the last good. year and a half. <laughs> and we were trying to reward outstanding teaching, and eventually <laughs> we were able to do it. But no state... You know, the, I mean, the NA said we're going to do everything we can to stomp out Governor Alexander's mm -hmm. idea, and they even raised teachers' dues to keep me from paying them more. You know, which I thought was an unusual <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> so, I, I, but but I think it's the holy grail of of K through 12 education. And today, today, every time I see an outstanding Tennessee teacher, they usually come up and thank me for the master teacher program and the career ladder. I mean, the president elect of the of the of the middle schools of, of America was in the other day. Mm -hmm. She was, thanked me. The leadership of the Tennessee Education Association <laughs> came in to me, and three out of the four of them were master teachers, voluntarily went up the career ladder, and they started out by thanking me for it. And I said, then why did you kill it? 
<laughs> but but the but once you come to Washington, the question is, should we mandate it from here? And I say absolutely not, because I know how hard it is and how difficult it is. And I see the Tennessee trying to do it again. Mm. How complex it is, and the last thing they need is someone from <coughs> here writing rules and second guessing what they do. Now, competitive <coughs> grant to help them do it, yeah. using their Title II money to help them do it, a teacher incentive fund grant to help them do it, all that's fine. But that would be an example of, of, of how I come down on it. Yeah, indeed, well, I think it could be said that the modern era well, of teacher. Not everyone agrees with me about that, yeah. by the way. Modern era of teacher evaluation has indeed emerged from Tennessee. Uh, uh, starting with the Sanders work there, uh, and uh, it's changed our lives in the last 10 years. Sorry, I, I was, I was just going to add one, one quick thing to that, and that is he's absolutely right about all the how hard it is and the design issues and so on, but, it, but another important feature and why I think, you know, I struggle sometimes with the common core is they're also paying, you know, 90 cents, you know, the vast majority of those salaries, and that ought to be in their purview, in the purview of local school districts and school boards and so on, and so I think you know, the, it, it's this calibration that we have to get right once mm -hmm. you abandon your, you know, perfect world. Uh, and so I agree heartily with, with Senator Alexander about that. And that's what we, that's our track record, too. I, 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 I missed your, your Common Core link here, and I wanted to get to the Common Core anyway. Explain what you, what, well, what you I, mean. Well, I mean, you know, obviously I have no particular issue with, the, with the, the kinds of things that are in the Common Core. I just think it's tricky for us to say, on the one hand, we want a common national standard, but we don't, but we want to really, and to use Arne Duncan's verbiage, uh, tight and loose, uh, that we're going to loosen up on who gets there. And so what we end up at the, with the, at the end of the day is, you know, advantage kids who get over this much more rigorous bar and loads of kids who, unable to meet basic grade level reading standards, are, are, you know, horrifyingly left behind. And so I just, I, you know, there are two, thi two levers, in my view, that we, you know, are the primary things to drive student achievement. One is, what do the kids know? The standards, the curriculum. And we've talked about kind of the local and state implications and the common core. And then, you know, do you have to get there? When do you have to get there? Who has to get there? Et cetera. And then the third bucket, of course, is, you know, what are the prescriptions that, that might uh, apply? And I think, you know, as I see those three buckets of things, the most, the thing I'm paying most attention to is that middle one. Who's getting there? How fast? Why not? Where are they? Um, as much as, you know, what do they know and what are we going to do to get them there? If that makes any kind of sense. Uh, some. <laughs> uh, is the Common Core an example, Lamar, of the, your distinction between national and federal? Uh, where as a uh, something spreading across the country organically it's a good thing but something that uh, uh, gets into the clutches of a federal um, mandate or, or requirement it can turn into a bad thing? Well you've, you, you've, you've said it right and that sounds like a nuanced thing but it's, it's really the, a, a very important difference. It's sort of the difference between America, America 2000 and Goals 2000 which was the first Bush education program and the Clinton education program. I mean, on the one hand, to me, the way our country works, uh, you can have goal, national goals. You can have uh, a variety of efforts to create national standards. You can create tests, all of which people may adopt. But if you try to impose them, it doesn't work. I mean, if, if one, one example would be Title II, the, the federal program for which is supposed to help encourage professional teaching. It's the biggest waste of money in the federal government because, and, and Arnie Duncan believes that, I believe that, I, I believe that. probably <laughs> believes that. It's and, unanimous. And, and yeah. Well, we want professionalized teaching, but when we order it from here, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. So it's, it, so I, I'm, I'm a big believer that when you cross the line from a, a set of policies and advocacies that encourage people to do things, to ordering them to do things from here, it doesn't work. And, I, and what I'm trying to say in all this is that I admire what's been done before, but I think we've we've reached the limits of what we can of, of what we can do from here with orders, and that having succeeded with a number of things and caused a number of things to to be in to be done locally, the Common Core's, the standards, the tests, accountability systems, maybe they all wouldn't have happened without No Child Left Behind. Well, let's say. Let's say that's true, mm -hmm. but now that they have happened, well, then let's let them be invested in by the people who create them and, and put the give them the responsibility for 
for doing things. Okay. We're going to open up in just a few minutes uh, to the studio audience and the uh, worldwide audience. Uh, so uh, get ready. Um, I want to um, take you back to two, ish, two provisions of No Child Left Behind, um, both of which give me uh, misgivings and ask you about uh, your view in retrospect. One, we alluded to both of them actually already. One is the highly qualified teacher mandate, mm -hmm. uh, which I realized did not originate in the White House. Uh, and the other is the uh, let each state pick its own standards. Uh, issue, which um, uh, some say has uh, fostered not very high standards. Okay, well, so I'll start with the with the highly qualified teacher, and and you're right. I mean, that was, and you know, anybody who was there at the time knows that that was an, an issue that the Democrats felt strongly about, in particular George Miller. Mm -hmm. um, what what uh, President Bush needed was the accountability, the reading focus, the the choice stuff, the supplemental services, those sorts of things. It was, you know, certainly their their priority. And I, I think the evidence is that it, it hadn't worked very well. It's a lot of kind of bureaucracy and, and process uh, to, with, with not a heck of a lot to show for it. So is, is that one of the things that ought to be changed and rethought in the new law? You bet. Um, secondly, on the, on the standards issue, you know, this is one that, you know, if we in fact do uh, trust local people, uh, and citizens to, uh, you know, understand and value uh, and create, and I'm talking teachers too, obviously, because, you know, I think Senator Alexander and I are probably two of the, few, you know, there's a few people who have been through these standards and curriculum battles at the state level in this town, for, even though the, there, there's a lot of talk about it, um, and sort of the process that goes into that you know, that when they're paying 90% of the, of the load, that they ought to have something to say about it. And, you know, this whole voluntary notion, as Senator Alexander describes, I have no issue with. Um, I just think that, uh, you know, as long, I'm all for the Common Core if we were, I'll make a deal with you, Checker. Okay. I'll be for the Common Core, rock solidly, hook, line, and sinker, if you'll be for, for my accountability rubric that ties some consequences to whether we're going to get there and whether poor and minority kids are going to get there, too. We should probably each summon our attorneys to enter into this <laughs> negotiation uh, and draft the contract uh, and see how much wiggle room there is in it. But yes, okay. Uh, the uh, uh, so on this, um, I, I think you've made yourself pretty clear on this, Lamar. What, which is that the Common Core is a good thing if states want to do it, but uh, uh, they, at the end of the day, need to be sovereign with respect to things like their academic standards for their students. Well, well, they should, but, but this is not 1980 or even 1985. I mean, for a variety of reasons, since then, we have almost all states with Common Core, with standards, with tests, working now with accountability systems. Everybody's very, and, and with the reporting that mm -hmm. we now have to back that up. So all, a, lot, a, a lot has happened on the highly qualified teachers. <laughs> that hasn't worked very well, and, it's a, it's an, and one might expect that from a policy skeptic. Uh, I mean, there are 3.2 million teachers. It's hard to uh, set rules here that evaluate them. The constructive thing to do, I think, is to move from that to doing every thoughtful thing we can do to encourage and reward and honor those school districts and states that are creating good teacher and principal evaluation systems that, that have some element that has to do with student achievement. Now, everybody says to me who had never fooled with that, well, that ought to be easy to do. It's really not. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it'll probably be done different ways, many different places, mm -hmm. but if it, it's, to me, the ho holy grail of it. So that's what to do with ho highly, qualified, highly qualified teachers, and on, uh, that, which is what you ask. Okay. About. Uh, on the reporting system, let's do give credit where it's due. The, the NCLB has fostered a whole lot more information about school level uh, 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 achievement. And uh, we, uh, Margaret alluded earlier to NAEP, and Mark Music sitting in the front row, and, and you, Lamar, helped give birth to the modern, the modern NAEP uh, with the uh, state level reporting and achievement levels built into it. And what, all these what really happened was Checker did that. He just had me do it. <laughs> well, you did it brilliantly. Yeah. Uh, in any case, the, the combination of school level reporting and state level reporting uh, around some what, what amount to standards built into the NAEP reporting now, uh, the basic proficient advanced, uh, has indeed changed things hugely since 1983. I don't know if you were in Kenny Bunkport uh, in that session with Secretary Bell after the Nation at Risk report when the, a lot of governors 
said, so Mr. Secretary, what's the metrics we can use to compare the performance of our states? Uh, and uh, he went furiously back to the Department of Education and said to his ablest people, well, what are we going to give them to, to metrics? And it turned out it was SAT scores. Um, because there was nothing else with state level data uh, in, in, in those days. And uh, that led to the, there's a few people in the room are old enough to remember this, uh, the legendary wall chart of, of Ted Bell's for two or three or four consecutive years. Uh, when, and and the, uh, the chiefs in particular so hated this uh, that they actually, I think, um, I think Mark helped coax them into this. Uh, the chiefs so hated this that they finally agreed to let NAEP be used uh, as a state-by-state -state measure, uh, which was then codified in the uh, Alexander James Report and the 1988 statute. Anyway, a little enough history here. Let's open it up. Uh, the I should remind. We'll check her just yeah. sixty seconds. Of a minute. I mean, the Nash, the NC, the Na No Child Left Behind statistics give any future Secretary of Education an enormous opportunity because we, we call NAEP the nation's report card, but, but really a secretary of education can create a whole new consumer's report mm -hmm. for, for Americans, 100,000 public schools, with information that we've just never had before. And mm -hmm. he can, or she, can yep. actually say uh, to, to, to schools and to states, I've got some information that, that uh, the people of this school district need, need, need to hear. Good, you're absolutely right, you're absolutely right. Okay, let me remind the worldwide audience that they can email questions to uh, questions at edexcellence.net and they can tweet us at hashtag NCLB10, uh, NCLB10. So uh, the floor is open for uh, 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 real questions, not, uh, not, not checker style pontifications from the floor. Uh, and we'll ask you to identify yourself briefly and roll your question. And there are mics uh, and you've got the first one. And you are. First of all, I want to commend you, Senator, for working across the aisle during the markup. Um, more assertively and actively than anyone else I saw. Having said that, have there been any behind-the-scenes conversations about putting together a bipartisan approach with the House and Senate leaders and moving forward on No Child Left Behind? Because we're all getting kind of tired of waiting. Yeah. <laughs> I don't blame you, and, and, and we're getting kind of tired of the waivers, or at least I am, which are the result of Congress in action. Uh, the, there were a lot of bipartisan discussions at the beginning of this Congress. Arne Duncan did a good job of that. We sat down. We, we basically made, I mean, Senator Enzi and I basically made a list of nine things that we thought we could do to simplify and extend uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and uh, we, we, we pretty well agreed on that. House had a little different point of view, uh, but but it kind of, and the president got involved a little bit, and so it was all going pretty well. We had several meetings, but uh, all that energy dissipated a few few months ago. So I think what we have to do is is uh, pick up where we left off at, at the, you know later this year and try to come out at the beginning of next year as fast as we can and get it done. I mean, there's no excuse for not reauthorizing the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. I mean, No Child Left Behind wasn't meant in the terms it was written to last this long, and as a no. result, it's not going to work. <laughs> right. Not because it was flawed for that reason. It wasn't designed to last this long with its goal and the other things. And uh, so it, 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 uh, some of the problems with No Child Left Behind are the direct result of Congress in action. And, and I'll, I'll do my best. I worked to, 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 to try to get out of the Senate. We, we got it into committee, but hasn't been brought any further. Yes, next. Okay, front row. Mike. Uh, hey, Mike must come <coughs> to you. Oh. <laughs> and you must speak into it. Okay. Is your name Mike? <laughs> so I'm Matt Luce with the National Association of Counties. Um, Senator Bennett recently said that the quality of education that's available for K-12 students is directly related to the zip code in which they go to school. Um, how do you think the best way to close that opportunity gap is? Well, Senator Bennett knows a lot about education. He's a terrific uh, educator, having, having done a great job in Denver, and he's right about that. He's right about that, primarily because of the, the families. The, I mean, what, <laughs> the parents are by far the most important factor in any child's education, and, and, and often families who have uh, parents who are, have more money and more education 
uh, and who live in that kind of zip code uh, spend more time with their children and help them get a better education, no doubt about it. One best way to do it is to <coughs> give children who live in other zip codes more choices of schools. That's what we do with colleges and universities. A second way to do it are all these things we've just been talking about, from uh, reporting to <coughs> common core curriculum to test to those standards to accountability systems, to charter schools, to uh, all, all those devices we now have in place. And finally, I would say a, a big spotlight, which now, thanks to the reporting requirements of No Child Left Behind, the United States Secretary of Education can, can compare, compare zip codes. Uh, w one other thought, I mentioned the College Station example, where you've got the poor kids over here and the professor's kids over here. You, you know what the academic result probably is, and some of it's related to money and a, a, a $500 Pell Grant for kids to every family would put, would probably uh, go to 90% of the kids who live over here and that would help them have more after school programs and, 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 and maybe have a better shot. Do you want to take a swat at this one also, the, uh, this equity question? Yeah, well, I, you know, our, our, everybody's friends with Joel Klein in this room, and <clears throat> I heard it, we did a thing together the other day, and, and he said, uh, he asked, you know, would you send your child to a public school in New York? And a lot of people, this is the very rarefied era of the Council on Foreign Relations, everybody, ra you know, uh, answered yes. Um, and, and then he said, would you send your kid to any school? in the New York public schools or any school in the Houston public schools or the Memphis schools? And of course the answer is not for my kid. And so I think uh, th this power of you know, uh, accountability and requirements and, and consequences around no child left behind, a deadline for your kid anywhere uh, is important and powerful. And that's why we've seen school people attend to those schools and those populations as never before. Good, next. Right in the center. It's probably on. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm with the Education Writers Association, and this question pertains to comparing uh, divvying up um, uh, K through 12 funds uh, as we do for um, you know Pell grants and staffers on the college level. There's a lot of uh, uh, variance in the quality of higher ed institutions, and uh, it seems that, uh, you know, the allowing for fund mobility isn't really fixing that, or <coughs> it is, it's not addressing the fact that some schools are a lot better than others, so if you're relying on the college model, how, how do you, how do you <coughs> adjust for that on the K-12 level, that even with fund mobility, you're still going to have a huge gap in school quality. Well, thank you for the question. I think, t uh, one, the goal should be to give every student an opportunity to attend the best possible school, which you have with college. I mean, you can take your Pell Grant and your grant and loan or your Hope Scholarship if you live in Tennessee, and you can go to a whole variety of places. And if you're, you don't have to go to a bad school, you can go to a better school. <clears throat> the second goal would be to have, as a whole, uh, the largest collection of superior institutions and by every measure even though there are a lot of things wrong with them by every measure the United States not only has some of the best colleges in the world it has almost all the best colleges in the world so uh, that model looks like a pretty useful model to me for schools because uh, if you it gives every student <coughs> or to most students an opportunity to choose among schools so they can go to a good one instead of a less good one. And second, the end result is, it's created the best system of higher education in the world. But the top 30 or 40 schools account for, I don't know, some single digit percentage of all the students who are enrolled in college. Do what? The mm -hmm. top 30 or 40 schools. Not many kids get to go into the best universities, no, he said. Well, no, wait a minute. The 75% the, the of our students go to public institutions. If you took the, ha if you took the 50, best institutions and in colleges and universities in America, half of them would be public. The average tuition at those universities is about $8,000 a year. So there are plenty of opportunities, extraordinarily good schools for anybody who wants to go to college in this country. And, there, and half the students have a grant or a loan. We, we have $100 billion in new loans every year. We have $40, million, $40 billion, of, I think that's the right number, of 
kilograms. Maybe it's 25. It's some big number. It's a lot of money. Can I just add one quick thing? Yeah, yeah please. Well, I, I, my, uh, what I think we ought to do is, in, in K-12 education, we have a lot of information and very little choice. In higher ed, we have a lot of choice and very little information. Correct. And we ought to try information and choice uh, more vigorously in both of those environments. Correct. And you had a, a terrific commission report uh, from Charles Miller and others that uh, attempted to rectify the higher ed part of this problem. Well, it, it, it attempted to begin a discussion about what we ought to do on, on a variety of fronts, including, you know, making sure kids are better qualified to be successful in higher ed, et cetera, accessibility, affordability, and accountability, and transparent information. Yeah. But it was a start. I w just wanted to add, one of the arguments for uh, choice in K-12 education isn't uh, simply getting <laughs> everybody into the best schools. Uh, one of the arguments is helping kids get out of the worst schools. Uh, that is the uh, sort of was the fundamental rationale in the public school choice provisions and of NCLB, NCLB. Yeah, uh, and that is the fundamental rationale of let's say for example the Ohio voucher program mm -hmm. uh, is to uh, is to enable kids to flee these uh, dropout factory death trap schools uh, into something better even if it's not necessarily the best school in the world. Next, uh, you. Then we'll get up to Barbara. Who are Hi. you? I'm Megan Wolf. I'm with ASCD. Um, and we recently adopted um, an initiative to ensure that, um, that we address the whole child, that whole child education is the best way to prepare students for college, career, and citizenship. And that this, in turn, is the best way to ensure that our country can be globally competitive in the future, that we have an adequate uh, pool of prepared and fit uh, potential military recruits. And, Honestly, these kids are our future voters and leaders. So I'm wondering um, what you all believe, if you believe there's a federal role in addressing college career and citizenship readiness, and if so, what is that role? You want to start? I know you feel strongly about well, the civic stuff, so take it away. Well, I believe one of our big failures is not <coughs> teaching enough United States history. You know, our biggest, our biggest, uh, the worst scores of college seniors are not in math and science, they're in United States history because we don't teach it. And what we can, there are a number of things that are going on at the federal level because I've looked at them and I'm, I won't get into all the details about it, that are small to encourage the teaching of United States history and citizenship in our schools. Most of that has to be done uh, by state legislatures and governors and, and private organizations who put, who put a focus on, on that. I think it's very important. Yeah, I, I would just add just quickly, I, I may obviously agree with, with Senator Alexander. We talked a lot about and worked on those things uh, over the, in, in the Bush years. Uh, she but, was very good on it. But, <laughs> but thank you. But, but I do think it's a little bit of this state-federal thing again, right? So that's why, you know, I've heard a lot, you know, that No Child Left Behind does narrow the curriculum because it focuses on reading and math only. However, when kids read better, and we have saw it in the, in the civics results that, that showed up in the NAEP, uh, that's that it's better all around for other for science and social studies and civics and the like so I think uh, it's primarily a state and local issue but uh, certainly something that we ought to continue to bring best practices to uh, from Washington so let me interject a question from the intergalactic audience uh, that has emailed in a hot button issue uh, what about the Tea Party, which sees no role for the feds? Can more moderate GOPers work around them, quote unquote? Well, they could join me in my ideal <laughs> position. <laughs> <laughs> I was Tea Party before Tea Party was cool. I mean, was that, that was the, the Ice the, Tea Party, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, you know, I, as I said, I, I agree with, I, thank you, Checker, that was a good, uh, even, even, even if we were somehow to swap K through 12 for states and, and, and the states took over mm -hmm. all of K through 12, I can't imagine a president who wouldn't care a lot about advocacy for, for education mm -hmm. and probably have a principal advisor who'd help him or her uh, mm -hmm. do that. So, so there's always going to be a national role in education. And, and, and based on where we actually are today, I think we need to deal with where we are today. I think we need to take the advantages of what's happened over the last 30 years and move in the direction that 
that I think we should go, which I think is to move uh, whether schools and teachers are succeeding back to to decisions by local schools. Okay. Just a couple thoughts yeah. about that. When I hear that, I wonder, I mean, do you mean like no IDEA, no Pell Grant, no Office of Civil Rights, no nothing? Um, and, and, and so, or, or, is that, or do they mean for that to go somewhere else? I mean, I just, you know, kind of ponder that. Uh, the second thing I would say is, you know, and back to, the, to Senator Alexander's framework of the practical and pragmatic, you know, I saw, you know, George Bush as a different kind of Republican <coughs> you know, level the playing field on education because it resonated with women and Hispanic voters and it is what, what is going to make for us to be a long-term governing party. And so just as a practical matter, I don't think it's a, a smart political tactic, notwithstanding the various policy reasons we spent the last, you know, hour and some talking about uh, for us to take that, to take that position. Okay. It is true that because uh, President George W. Bush was talking about education, so much it made it such a priority that during that time Republicans for the first time in mm -hmm. memory were thought of as, as being better than Democrats on education yeah. so when presidential leadership makes a difference uh, Barbara uh, somebody bring her a mic hi I'm Barbara Davidson with um, Common Core the nonprofit organization at the Fordham Institute uh, it was helpful in incubating it's down the hall yeah right it's a different hall. yes <laughs> Um, I'm intrigued by Senator Alexander's uh, uh, idea that the Secretary of Education now could uh, publish all of this information that between NCLB generated proficiency uh, information and some factoring for how that test squares up with NAEP, that that seems to be a fairly simple algorithm that could be generated where we would have the kind of information about every single school in the country that would be a real lever for this, this choice that we're seeking. So I, my question is, you know, why isn't that happening now? And is that a reasonable, <coughs> um, or it's probably not particularly sexy, but, but, it, but it might fly as a, you know, as a Republican sort of position to, to, to champion? Well, uh, I've talked with Arnie about it. I mean, it's not been happening because it's only the last few years we've had that kind of information. And it's not that easy to do. You'd have, but I think, you know, it would be, great to sit down sit down with consumer reports i mean that's a very popular magazine they they, they know how to take information about uh all sorts of things mm -hmm. and turn it into useful information for ordinary consumers and people buy it and pay for it and <laughs> read it and rely on it so uh, um, i think it would be I, I think having the united states secretary of education make is one of his or her principal roles uh, producing a sort of consumer reports for american schools in in your neighborhood and in your state would be a great thing to do. It's something I would hope future secretaries of education would do. do you agree? I, I would just say absolutely, but I, you know, NAGB does a lot of this stuff. Now, is it you know, is it too wonky, and could it be made more consumer friendly? Absolutely, yeah. but I'd commend you to their website because a lot of it's there. I mean, that you know, I remember what Russ Whitehurst did a bunch of work on you know the alignment between you know NAEP and state standards, and that's why we're running around saying you know who has high standards and who doesn't. Because but, of it, but I think Barbara's talking about bring, bringing this down to Fairfax County, and uh, should the Secretary level. of Education or the school level, McLean High School? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, HHS does issue reports at the hospital level uh, to enable consumers of healthcare services to know something about how hospitals compare with each other on various. Well, markets. we're going to need a lot more NAEP testing in that regard. I mean, obviously, we have the TUDA, the Urban District NAEP, that yeah. can give us but that kind of granularity. What I would suggest is that you would you'd have to make some assumptions about and, and accept somebody's you know judgment about what the NAEP the state, and the, the state's the, the, the test state. interface. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. Unless the Common Core tests uh, leapfrog this problem, right. right? Which it probably will in a couple of years. A part of it falls. A part of what needs to be done uh, falls in the category of persuading at least half the people. You're right. So you, is, we, we've got a lot. We've got this information to get. Yeah. It, 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 it needs to be put together in a way that people can understand it and be a compelling way to read it. And then I can see a secretary going to Nashville and having a three-day conference with educators, yeah. bringing people all in, giving out all these reports, saying this is what happened, and, and, and that, that would be sort of a new and different role for a United States Education Secretary, and, and, and an important part of, a, of what so, you might do to move things along. Give the mic to Mark, and I'm going to then bring in another question from the outer cosmos. Go ahead. 
Mark Music, uh, sometimes East Tennessee State University these days. Uh, the Nate question, I can't resist this. Uh, if there is agreement, and there seems to be, uh, that the national assessment now our gold standard, you know, over 30 years that has changed, and yet, if my information is correct, and I, I could be wrong, even though there's this agreement, I understand that currently the difference in the House budget proposal and the Senate budget proposal for NAEP is different, and those wild spending House members are proposing to spend more than the Senate. And we're not going to have more, if that's true, more NAEP testing, or we're not going to have more history or civics testing, if that's the that's case. Just Senator, I don't know exactly if my numbers are right, but I guess I'm just saying uh, the support for NAEP should be one of those things that hopefully the House and Senate can agree on. Uh, Mark, you've told me something I didn't know, but I guess just well, I another example of those, of those visionary House Republicans coming up with a, <laughs> another, another good idea. And we'll try, I'll try to follow their lead. Okay. Uh, this is a little wonky, but from the uh, uh, outer reaches of the solar system. Uh, what should the federal role be regarding charter school accountability, particularly if the federal government is also encouraging the growth of charter schools? Uh, what is the role vis-a-vis -vis accountability while encouraging growth? Well, of course, charter schools are public schools and are subject to state accountability systems and should be, period. Okay. And reporting. Yeah. And reporting. Exactly. Okay. Um, Susan, now that you're in the front row, somebody bring the <laughs> mic. You'll never be late again, Susan. <laughs> uh, Susan Train in Ed Site, formerly BRT. Um, Margaret, your question about how to calibrate the appropriate federal role, I think is really the bottom line question. So really for Senator Alexander, um, there was a House hearing on reauthorization and one of the chiefs for change so a Republican chief, uh, a reform-oriented chief in a state that's doing really good things, basically said, we need the feds to tell us that we need to set targets for accountability. <coughs> because if it's up to our state legislatures and up to our own state, we're going to do what makes us look the best. That's just the natural inclination. You see this not just in education. You see it in financial services. You see it in every sector. Adults will do whatever makes them look the best mm -hmm. unless someone forces them to do something else. So Stop me before I kill again. Right. Okay. <laughs> so how do you respond to that, Senator I was. That's why I'm a Republican, because I don't believe that. But he's a Republican. I don't care if he is. Uh, I just don't believe that. I mean, I, that's offensive to me. I mean, why? why? What that says is I'm incompetent down here in my leadership capacity. I live with a bunch of dolts. They don't know what they want. They don't care about their children. They're going to be out drunk every night and not paying any attention to anything. Please, all you wise people in Washington, make us be good. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a minute. I mean, I don't know what makes, I mean, I come up here every week and then I go home. I don't get any smarter the day I come up here and then when I don't want any more for the people of Tennessee when I'm up here than I did when I was governor. And I do hear the same thing you just said. I've had school superintendents tell me, you've got to make us do it or we won't do it. Well, see, I don't think that'll work in the end anyway. I think if you just order them, you know, it may have helped get things started. But after that, I think people have to buy into things and do things for themselves. You know, I can do things, I can make my children do some things up to a point. But after a while, they're gonna have to do it for themselves. So all I can do is create an environment in which they're more likely to succeed. So I give Margaret credit, and I give everybody credit for helping us get to this point. I think we're at the point where we have to create an environment to help people succeed. I don't think we can make them do it from here. And excuse my strong reaction to it, but that's the way I feel about it. So, Do you want to come in on this? Well, I just want to, I mean, the only admonition I would say is, I think, you know, I've a couple, couple data points. One, I've seen in my Texas days, you know, the Texas... The, the, the TSTA, the Texas State Teachers Association, it was a hugely dominant force in a very conservative state legislature. 
you know, huge, you know, between them and the trial lawyers, they were the number one funders of, of local legislative races and were highly influential. And I think, I mean, I would be doubtful that we would see in the Illinois and the Pennsylvania, New York, California, et cetera, accountability systems and the sort of consequential things had it been left uh, to, to states. Fast forward 10 years. Uh, I think we're seeing in the waivers exactly that phenomenon. Well, we don't really want to do choice. The school people don't like it. It's a this and that. Uh, we're seeing super subgroups that are a way to mask uh, the achievement of African American, Hispanic, and special ed kids. Uh, so we're seeing that play out right here and right now. So yeah, we can we can you know trust and verify. But the verification is not there. And the only way I know is because I'm looking at the, what they are telling the federal government in their waivers that they're not going to do anymore. I, I keep wondering about the sort of Stockholm Syndrome, whether too much habituation to Washington telling us what to do has led us into a habit of expecting. I just, uh, have, to, I just have to stop there for a second. Check I just, it, like what? Like test once a year in reading and math and report it? Like have a state system of highly qualified teachers, you decide what it is. Like have a curriculum and standards, you decide what it is. I mean, I think this Washington mandate thing is no, it's so it's oversold it's just, and overblown. It's not just it's Title just not One; real. it's maintenance of effort for special ed spending and a whole variety of things that go down a whole bunch of programs into a whole bunch of requirements. Uh, the uh, I, I actually wonder if it's gotten people in the states uh, habituated to saying. Is saying they make me do it instead of I am I am responsible for making this decision, and I am deciding the right thing. Um, they make me do it, and therefore when I have a problem, I look to them to make me do it again. There was this episode in the media a few months ago when some chief, I think it might have been Utah, uh, called up Arnie Duncan and said, "Help me save the Common Core in my own state." Um, and uh, I, I, evidently, he hadn't taken Lamar's advice about. Uh, uh, lead your own place, uh, fix your own place. Okay, we've got just a couple minutes left and I see several more hands up, including two right in front of me here. So why don't you take the mic to one of them and then she can pass it to the person behind her. Uh, thank you, Alyssa Schwenk from Change the Equation. Um, and you both kind of touched on this concept of interest and as a former public school teacher, I saw it a lot, where the school itself is the best source of information for parents, particularly those who are disenfranchised. But it's very hard to tell a parent, you should probably take your kid to another school instead of just please give us one more year, we can fix this. And what's sort of the best way to reconcile giving schools and districts control while also getting parents educated in order to make those informed decisions about where to send their students? Good big I, question. I, I think the, the power of the ability to move some of those funds like Title I portability, mm -hmm. like supplemental services and tutoring, a little bit of cash to, to go with the dash. Okay. Uh, let's go right on to okay. you. I'm Mary Keller with Military Child Education Coalition. We do have federal children who live in every zip code whose parents serve our nation that, are, that people aren't paying attention to. And we also fail to do what we need to do for kids who move and change schools frequently. Could you all reflect on what we can do with the reauthorization of ESA to focus on children who perhaps have had a parent gone for years and years, for the last 10 years, or a parent who has profoundly changed. And these kids move three times more frequently than their civilian classmates. They, they do what? They move, they move three times more often, I think, from school to school because of the uh, parents being reassigned. Do you want me to start? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, Mary, good to see you, and thank you for your great work over so many years. It's so important. Um, you know, I think the power of No Child Left Behind and this information has, has helped with that, no doubt about it. And I think the Common Core will help with that. It will be a way that you can transport and say, here's where, where we are. And, and I think, you know, it, it, those issues uh, can get better attended to with that information. We ought to keep doing it. So, you know, I think those things married together will be helpful to that population. Anything more on this one? Well, I was told at the beginning that if we got Senator Alexander uh, out of here at 1030, he would then move the Congress to action. <laughs> uh, and, uh, <coughs> uh, and I believe Margaret's prepared to move the, move the universe. So uh, <laughs> why don't you join me in thanking them for a terrific session.